Well, good morning, everybody. Are we recording? Are we out on Zoom? Yes. So thank you all for coming and welcome back to another exciting season of RMM University. Um, can you all hear me? And if Willem, you can't you... hear me, raise your hand. And, and, and you have the people down here, Willem. Oh, oh, we've got the people online here. Okay. Uh, first of all, I wanted to start with uh, a big thank you to our uh, AV team. Um, if I name them, I'm going to miss somebody, so I'm not going to try and name them all. But uh, folks spent an awful lot of time uh, getting our lab moved from where we had it last year to setting it up in a mobile format that we can haul it down here, get it set up, uh, and uh, then haul it back out of here again. So. They were here all our last night and from Just early this morning. So thank you very much for all you guys for all the work you did uh, getting us ready for uh, the online session as well. Uh, uh, you know, given what I pay you, I will double your time for this uh, session. <laughs> uh, also, uh, thank you for uh, to Doug and uh, Wayne for uh, being our first presenters here. I'm sure they put in a tremendous amount of time getting ready for these. Um, the rule of thumb always is, you know, if you're gonna do an hour presentation, you're probably gonna spend at least 10 hours getting ready. And Wayne told me this morning, he's got about 40 hours in his presentation already. So uh, it does take a tremendous amount of work to get set up for these things. So I really appreciate uh, all of the presenters, uh, not only today, but uh, for the rest of the semester. Um, I also, uh, need to remind you that uh, RMHAM is a 501c3 uh, and we rely entirely on uh, the support of the community for uh, to put on uh, these kinds of events as well as support this uh, very large network of devices that we use to support not only uh, the RMM DMR network but also a number of other clubs like the Colorado Connection, CRA and others. So. Uh, your donations, uh, as always, is very much appreciated and will be put to very good use. And uh, do remember us uh, on uh, Colorado Gives Day, which is coming up in two months. Uh, RM Ham will be uh, one of the options on uh, Colorado Gives Day. So uh, we would very much appreciate uh, your uh, support in, in that. Uh, with that, um, we'll get started. Um, I think, Doug, you're on first. So uh, who's on first? Uh, I don't know. No, I thought that was third base. <laughs> what's, um, who's on first? What's on second is, I don't know, on third. Yeah, I, I don't know so Steve, first. do I have some audio? Uh, hello to Zoom. Maybe I can see the Zoom people here. Uh, Dave is in the room. We have Ted online. Can you guys, or I see Lou, Matt. Anybody able to hear us out there? Are we unmuted? I'm getting a thumbs up. You're sounding yeah. great. Okay, there we go. Hi, Ted. Uh, there we go. So on um, this fancy setup here. Well, good morning, all. Uh, Doug, K2AD. And I've got a bunch of cameras. I need tally lights to know who I'm, who I'm talking to. Uh, can you work on that, John? So uh, Will, Willem said uh, you put in about 10 times the amount. I'm going to try to get this done in about an hour, but uh, maybe, you know, and we have Wayne who has some really good practical, but I did not put in about 10 hours on this. I probably on this new material put in maybe six, but I leveraged the previous 10 hours that I did on antennas. So uh, for this, and if we find our pointer, I, in, in my, under 10 hours, I found this really cool screen background. And I like it because not only because it's colorful, but it's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, this is a solar flare. And when these things happen, HF bands react a particular way, VHF bands react a different. Uh, we may have different kinds of weather patterns that affect all of this. So. Willem told me, originally, I think you, we had, had me scheduled for like, and Wayne and I, for March, 
And then he says, I'm moving you up to October. And I said, okay, well, I'm gonna steal a lot of the stuff from previous because I don't wanna do this thing last minute. And I did not do it last minute. And Wayne said, just don't do it last minute. And we didn't, we finished Friday morning as opposed to this morning. So <laughs> we're doing better on time management. So, uh, so what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, we're gonna talk about what you can do with your radio that's different than working on a repeater or in your car. Uh, VHF, UHF, uh, this top photo is a repeater site implying this is what you probably use your radios for. The bottom is a particular 220 megahertz station. Uh, and that's actually one that I built. And I just like this one because it has the American flag on the top. Uh, this was our station that we built both for the September VHF contest. And we used this on September 2001. And two days later, we all know what happened on September 11th. So when we put this together and the contest was actually on September 11th, 2002, we decided we wanted to put a, put a flag up and remember what happened. And so we, we cobbed up, a, that was a piece of two inch mast. We found a flag, we used some brackets, we put it up there, we put a, put a uh, light on it so it would be illuminated at night. And it was the tallest tower that we had on the mountain and put the flag up. So I, I've always liked this photo. And uh, we had one, uh, I think it was a Vietnam veteran that came by and said that was disrespectful and we should take it down. And uh, we were like, well, it's the highest thing, it's lit. Uh, we thought it was respectful. And then this, I call him old duffer, was sitting over on a bench a little further away and he called me over after hearing this and he was wearing a baseball cap that had his ship number on it. And he goes, that's the best looking thing on this mountain. If you take it down, I'm gonna kick your ass. <laughs> and the ship number was BB63. Anybody know what BB63 was? Battleship Missouri. And I asked him, were you on it when the when the peace accord was signed and he said, yes. He says, you leave that flag up. I figured if a World War II veteran on the Missouri told me to leave that flag up, we better leave the flag up. So what we're gonna talk about is what can we do with our radios on VHF beyond the line of sight that we are accustomed to, beyond packet, I put in here ATV and RIDI, but we're accustomed to this radio, we key it up and Mark's got one on his desk over here and it talks to the repeater. Is that all we can do with these things? Well, with your handheld, probably, but with a little bit of other things, you can talk quite a ways on single sideband or digital modes now. Uh, as opposed to very, very large signal to noise ratios, we're gonna talk about communication when we're very much down at the edge of communication. So, uh, and I think I hit, I've got a monitor in the back here. Yep, so uh, the only thing I didn't mention is to do this, we've got to understand the communication. So what is line of sight? Uh, I think we kind of know, but I found these photos and these were stolen from the Mount Greylock Expeditionary Force uh, photo. Uh, this is a mountaintop on Mount Greylock in Massachusetts. It's the highest mountain in Massachusetts, a whopping 3,491 feet above sea level. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the bottom of your well is higher up here. But this for the East Coast is a major line of sight area you can see the TV tower in the red and white on the left photo for the guys. And the one on the right is actually a hang glider that was hang, hang gliding during the VHF contest and to the left of the war memorial, that stone structure for those of you on Zoom, you can see a, a, the roof of a building and a bunch of towers with dishes and antennas. That was an actual VHF contest. So if I'm running my handheld radio, and I go to the top of Mount Greylock, I can probably talk 90, 100 miles 
line of sight and communicate with somebody. But what if they're on the backside of that ridge? That signal on FM is just not gonna get there. With what we're gonna talk about today, it's how to send that signal over the ridge by running it off of a meteor trail or a tropospheric duct or a moon bounce or something. But line of sight on these is basically the horizon. Uh, we're gonna work over the horizon. And uh, so just kind of a cool photo. And I didn't steal this because this is actually where that American flag photo on the previous one. And I'm, I've been a member of this group, although I'm not active today, uh, been out there. Uh, these slides are on the web. I would recommend you take a look at, follow this link, uh, Dr. Tarpley and for UFP. I came across his uh, presentation and he, I've never met Mark, but it, he seems a lot like Willem. Willem's a PhD, multiple PhDs, but he's very practical. He knows what end of a soldering iron to grab. Many PhDs are highly theoretical and talk way over your level. I was very impressed with Mark's slides, Dr. Tarpley's slides, that I've stolen a few, and if you see this orange background, but go to that link and, and take a peek. So this is one of his that uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit, and he just, nothing very major here, but he said it so well, I just given him credit. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about tropospheric scatter, ducting, sporadic E, meteor scatter, auroral and uh, moon bounce. You're probably not gonna go out tomorrow and your first thing is to build a moon bounce station, but maybe. Uh, I did it, but I did these other things that are further up on the list first then I went into the moon bounce, and after I'd made a few contacts, I said, okay, I've done that. Now well, let's, let's see if we can do this a little easier. Uh, we're going to talk about CW, sideband, and then the digital modes uh, in this. So when you're dealing with weak signal, and you're not just trying to talk and these are my words and Dr. Tarpley's pictures, but I really liked the way he showed these pictures. Uh, when we're going, we can deal with propagation in the troposphere, either by scattering or ducting. And what happens is in the upper right photo for the guys on Zoom, you, you see there's some charged diffraction points in, in the troposphere. And what's gonna happen is when we send our signal into that, it's gonna bounce a little bit up, a little bit out, a little bit down, all around. And the key is, can we pick up a little bit of signal down on the ground? And that's probably gonna be over the horizon as he shows in his photo here, or in his diagram. If I'm transmitting out, as I said, I'm gonna maybe make 100, 120 miles, depending on, if we're on Pikes Peak, we have a pretty, I'll bet you John knows what the horizon from Pikes Peak is. I'm guessing 120 miles? 140 miles. But, and you guys have probably worked the Pikes Peak, used the Pikes Peak repeater. Uh, you can get out about 100, 110 miles with your mobile before you, start to peter out, but that's a big strong, you need a big strong signal as opposed to we're gonna be looking for a really weak one. The other piece is we can get ducting that goes on in the uh, troposphere. Wayne and I were talking about this last night and the ducting doesn't tend to be as prominent here in the, uh, in the mountain region, uh, the Rockies on the East Coast and on the West Coast, and especially over water, you can probably see a duct, tropospheric duct every week, uh, if not each day to a point. But we do get them occasionally. Uh, I don't know if I've ever really seen tropospheric ducting here in Colorado, uh, other than John and I were once working on a repeater problem where the Thoradin Mountain repeater was, 
heavily interfered with with a repeater in, I think, in Leavenworth, Kansas. Was it North Platte? There was also one in Kansas, I thought, but we would get a duct and all of a sudden the two repeaters would be connected together and we didn't intend for them to be connected together. So this happens where on our upper photo, we're scattering off of charged particles and things. Uh, in the lower photo, we're getting into a layer where you can see here in his photo, he's got it as uh, very short bounces, but it can also be a very gradual bending that just kind of makes an arc and comes back to ground. Depends on how, how the duct is, how long it is and where it is. But uh, this can typically extend 800 to 1,000 miles. Uh, I remember one of my very first VHF contests when I still lived on the East Coast. I went to that Mount Greylock. We had the tropospheric duct to end all ducts. It, this was the best I've ever seen. A hurricane had come through, left warm and cold air in the right places. We could actually look from that uh, photo I had before, if I can make this work, uh, as we looked out on the left photo, right above this mountain range, we could see this purple band from horizon to horizon as we looked out, and that was the duct. And we were able to put our signal into that, and it, I remember working a gentleman on 432 megahertz in Georgia, and he was running one of these little uh, Grisham novel sized radios with the little three watt with the uh, rubber duck antenna on it. On 432 from Atlanta to Western Massachusetts, all because of a tropospheric duct. Uh, what was kind of interesting is this guy then got in his airplane with the same radio. And as he came up to about the same elevation as we were, the signal was S9 plus 20 dB, three watts from Atlanta. As he went above and below that, it drastically dropped off. But just interesting stuff. You'll see, I, I have a reference on the bottom, a uh, friend of mine, Wayne Overbeck, N6NB. He has done a lot of ducting work from his, uh, where he lives in Southern California and Hawaii. And he's now starting to do it, do duct uh, de-expeditions and distance measurements in the Caribbean. And it's just amazing that you can be on uh, a hilltop over the ocean in California and at a similar spot in Hawaii, and you could literally talk on two handheld radios. And this is a regular occurrence. So how can you tap in on some of these? The other thing that uh, Wayne is going to go into some real detail on is meteor scatter. This is another one of Dr. Tarpley's documents that just said it all, so I figured why redo it. Uh, when meteors hit the atmosphere, they leave ionized particles and charges, and you can briefly get communication, past communication during these pings. They call, sometimes call them ping jockeys if you're on the radio opposed to disc jockeys, it's a ping jockey. If you're trying to do Morse, some people have sent Morse code at like, recorded it and sped it up and sent it at 60 words a minute, and then you slow it down unless you can copy 60 words a minute, which I cannot. Um, you slow it down because you, you've only got this brief ping that lasts for potentially a 10th of a second to a second to he says the long trails only last 15 seconds. Most are less than a second. So if we're speaking, can you send your call sign on sideband in a second? Well, you can potentially get part of it through. And one of the reasons that the really big VHF contest stations, if they're gonna do six meter sideband meteors, they want, you want really short call signs that can be understood without phonetics. And ours wasn't great, but you could understand W2S said, W2S said, W2S said, W2S said. And they would hear that and you would get enough in the ping that they would, oh, that's W2S said. They've been doing VHF contests for 20 years. I know who they are. And they would come back with 
Now, if uh, I'm trying to see who has the longest worst call sign, maybe Don does, but for Meteor, if he comes back with KE0MGT, the chances of me getting that on a Meteor on sideband is pretty low, but it can be done. You, we just have to have a big, a big ping. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Meteors and a lot of this will make more sense when Wayne starts to talk about uh, how to do this with the digital, the WSJT, the JT44s, I'm not even sure what we're calling it anymore, but the digital modes. So um, this is really primer such that you can, and I guess I should have asked, who here has an HF plus six meter radio at home? Okay, we got a bunch of people. How many of you, and I know John does, how many of you have a six meter antenna for it? Okay. We, we should, uh, during Wayne's part, uh, maybe dial it in on the screen, but uh, a lot of people can do meteor scatter, six meters. All you need is a basic antenna. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. So the way we say where we are on weak signal is we don't say Colorado or Denver. We would say actually Denver is Delta Mike 7.9. Uh, I happen to live up in Firestone, which is Delta November 70. And if you want more detail, you can say Delta November 70 Mike Delta. And that's a six digit grid square as opposed to a four digit. I see there's a uh, eight digit and you can keep going even beyond because we used to, for microwave, I used to operate from Fox November 32 JP 92 Victor Sierra. And that is almost down to a 50 foot <laughs> range. People knew exactly where to point their dish uh, at that point. So we use these grid squares. Uh, they are worldwide. And the big designators, the Delta November is basically the Northwest US. Uh, the Southwest Delta Mike, Southeast Echo Mike, and Northeast Echo November and Fox November. Uh, I used to operate from that mountain is in Fox November 3-2. Uh, just, you know, but uh, so when, when you get really good at this and you say, you know, like a uh, friend of John and mine, uh, Steve Castro that runs Downey's Microwave, he'll tell you, oh, I'm Echo Lima 89. Go, oh, you're in Florida. Yeah, you, you, you kind of get to know the grid squares. And you can get one of these maps. Uh, there's one by ICOM that they'll give you is, they've got a little advertising on it. And they'll give you a very nice grid square map in exchange. It's very nice of them to present those. You can get this from the league. And this is the one that I normally use uh, there. So place you'll want to take note of is dxmaps.com. And this is an actual screenshot of DX Maps yesterday. Uh, it was, I think, yesterday morning when I did this. Uh, on the lower left here for the Zoom people is I put in the green uh, landmark my house, DN70MD. Uh, and uh, all of those lines are uh, active QSOs that have been reported. Not a lot of them, huh? Uh, I can't quite read that, but WA, WB7 something, probably up in Wyoming. <laughs> Excuse me, I got the hiccups all of a sudden. Talking to some guy either in Oregon or Washington. Get a drink here. Uh, and this presentation sponsored by Panera, who we had breakfast with this morning. Uh, the, uh, not a lot of activity, but look at the one on the right. Europe was hopping, wasn't it? There's a little uh, bigger picture of Europe. Quite a bit of activity uh, yesterday morning, which would have been yesterday afternoon in Europe. You can see the red lines, the green lines, but what do those mean? Well, red line, sporadic E, the green line was tropo, 
And these were all the stations that were working each other, reporting in. There's a black that was an unknown. I don't even know where Sugar 9, Oscar Kilo, S9, uh, it's, there's an island out here, isn't there? I don't know. Somebody with the internet, tell me where Sierra 9, Oscar Kilo is located. But uh, I think this is the equator, isn't it? Right about here? Or is the equator here? Uh, no, it's going to be down here because, no, maybe that's the equator. Because there's, there's Ecuador, so. Okay. Well, just looking at this, I'm trying to, there's Panama, Colombia, Ecuador. So this is the equator. I don't know if this was a transequatorial. Well, transequatorial would be symmetric across. Who knows what this propagation is? I, I don't even know if Wayne has a guess, uh, but that may be a, a, a false entry. But guys were working a lot of stuff. And you can look at this and see, is it sporadic E, is it multi-hop? Occasionally you'll see the dark red line where it comes up and goes over and it's going up, coming down, going up, coming down, and what we call a double hop. Uh, and that's typically how sporadic E will work from, do I? When you see a sporadic E from the east coast to the west coast, it's usually a double hop. The signal goes up, hits, hits the meteor, comes down, goes back up, hits another one, and comes back down again. Or the thunder, thunder cloud that's ionized that you can bounce a signal off of. So very good sight, and you can kind of see what's going on. Uh, Aurora, and I think I have a slide on Aurora, but uh, it is possible when this big flare occurs, it eventually hits the earth, gets channeled down into the North Pole and creates the Northern Lights. What is that? Ionized energy that we've come across from, I guess not meteors, it's really solar particles. Uh, I'm not a PhD, uh, so, but it intercepts by the earth, is channeled down at the poles and we get this northern lights. What are the northern lights? It's ionized particles coming down that illuminate. They're like a curtain that's kind of flapping and they're moving. Well, if we're far enough north that we have view of that, of those particles, we can bounce our signal off of it and it comes back down somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, imagine a, a globe three dimensionally, there's this curtain moving around, kind of fluttering like the stage curtain in your high school. And, or the Johnny Carson, as he comes out, it moves. And so the signal goes up and bounces and comes down. You have to be far enough north. I think Wayne said he's only seen one or two from Colorado. And it, my guess is six meters only. Two meters, okay. Okay, two meters, fairly common for a good aurora, you can work on six, two meters. You'll be able to do it first on six. So if you have a multiband station, you'll first detect it on six meters. The curtain will start to form. You'll start to work people. But as your signal bounces off of this, if you're on single sideband or even CW, you, it's distorted because there's phase impurities in this. So a CW signal when an aurora is really potent will not sound like a tone, it'll sound more like a white noise. You'll hear this All of the tone is distorted out and you just hear these bursts of noise. When it goes to sideband, you don't get a nice clean single sideband. You get this, I was trying to get a little bit of water in my throat. You get this, it sounds like they're whispering. You'll, you'll hear QRZ, QRZ Aurora. And you've got to try to understand that while the signal is going up and down and level. And as the Aurora becomes stronger, that distortion becomes stronger. On CW, normally you take your VFO and you'll go until it's gone. 
on an aurora, you'll you'll go up and you hear. <laughs> you just pick the middle of the noise. So when an aurora starts, the signals are probably very weak. People are whispering very weak, and you're gonna have trouble hearing. So you'll want to go to CW. But as the aurora gets better and better, you can switch to sideband and their voice is far enough out of the noise floor that you can hear them. But then as it gets really good, the distortion is tremendous and you have to switch back to CW. Uh, but just interesting stuff that you may hear that occasionally. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, okay, time in myself here. What can you do for some radios? Uh, I just put a few examples up here. Uh, on the upper left is one that I still own to this day. You can find them used for not a lot of money. And that's an HF plus six meter plus two meter. It'll do 100 watts on HF, 100 watts on 50, and I think 100 watts on two meters as well. Um, great little radio. They, they come in, this is a 746. They have a I think a 746 Pro 2 or a Pro, and that has a little bit fancier stuff. I've got the older one, just the regular 746. Uh, it has two antenna connectors on the back for HF and six meters, and a third connector for two meters. So you could hook this up and run HF six meters on those two antennas, and then hook your two meter antenna and be on a number of bands. You can get an interface box to put this on the digital modes if you want. Good little radio. I don't know what they go for, but you don't have to spend a, you don't have to buy a $5,000 radio to get started here. Uh, speaking of, yeah. So talking about $5,000 radios, if you want it all in one box, you notice this one on the lower left for the Zoom people go from, seven megahertz, it's I'm sure 160 meters, 1.8 through uh, 1296. Uh, and there may be like additional charges for the 1296 module. I don't know if it's built in or not. I can't even afford to walk into HRO and look at this thing, let alone buy one. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it costs, but I would guess that that's, is that a $5,000, $3,000 radio? Um, Lower right, uh, an IC910, John owns, I think, two of them. Uh, and you can get them on two and two meters, 432. I don't think it has, 1296 is an option module, isn't it? Okay, does not do six meters, but if you want a two meter, 432, you wanna do satellites, this is a great radio. Yeah, yeah. And on the upper right is my favorite. Uh, I have one of these, uh, an Elecraft K3, HF and six meters. And if I want to go to other bands, uh, you can buy an Elecraft two meter transverter, or you can get external transverters and take it to other bands. So speaking of the transverter, has anybody here in the room never seen a transverter? Doesn't know what I'm talking about? Do you all know what a transverter is? Okay, so I'm seeing some that are saying yes. I'm assuming somebody on Zoom probably has not seen the transverter. But what this is, is I put two very old radios up there. That's just a sample. But these are the some of the radios that I have used with transverters. It's an old Kenwood 8 TS830. Circa's 1980 design, maybe even earlier. Tube finals. There's probably somebody out there that has one of these that the tubes are bad. Well, if I'm running it with a transverter, I'm gonna run very low power and I don't need those finals, so I'm gonna turn them off. <laughs> you can probably pick up one of these for 200 bucks. Uh, they're old, people don't want them anymore. They don't have a LCD display. Over on the right, a TS440, I, I, I got rid of my TS830 because it just died completely. I still have a TS440. And, uh, but the transverter takes low power HF, usually 28 megahertz, 
and converts it to another frequency, two meters, 220, 432. You only need, you need under a tenth of a watt, typically a 10 milliwatts of power, and it will generate a signal on two meters in one of these, I think this one is a two meter and this is a 432 transverter. So I put 10 milliwatts of 28 megahertz in and 432 at 10 watts comes out. Reciprocal, there's circuitry in here and you can see the filters in this middle left picture. Uh, we put in 432, it down converts it, filters it, amplifies it and sends it into your receiver such that you can hear it. If you were gonna be on 432.1 megahertz, you tune your HF rig to 28.1 megahertz and you're listening and transmitting on 432. You can pick up a transverter for a used one at a ham fest for hundred bucks. Or if you get a brand new one that's like the one on the right, that's just in a metal box, doesn't have a lot of fancy stuff. That's probably a three, $400. And on the left with the fancies and the, the extra heat sink on the lower left there that says down east microwave, that's obviously probably got a 80 watt amplifier in there. It's gonna be a little bit more money, but this is a very inexpensive way to get onto the VHF UHF band. So at this point, if you're interested in this, you could use your HF plus six and we're gonna talk about some simple antennas to do that with what you got, get on the air, you're probably gonna wanna listen carefully to Wayne's part because he's gonna tell you how to have success with that. But if you wanna get into the other bands, you can do that as well. Is that making sense before we go to antennas? John is saying no, because he's never done this before, this hour is he's making meteor scatter contacts over there. What are you guys on Zoom? Uh, do, do, do we have the phone lines open? Hello? This is, this is Dr. Doug, you're on the air. I see a thumbs up from Ted. Uh, you guys online have any questions, thoughts, comments before we move forward? And I'm looking down at the screen here to all you guys, I'm not seeing anything. Not I think I remember ham fests. <laughs> you remember ham fest, Lou? <laughs> that was Lou, wasn't it? I think I saw the box come up on you. No, that was somebody else. No, that was somebody else. Who who thinks they remembered ham fests? Well, that would be me. Oh, Ted. Th there, there's Ted. Okay, uh, I've got to look for the little yellow box to come up on my Zoom screen here. I, I will compliment our AV team. They really did well. They put in the LED wall that you guys can see to my left and right behind me. I have a nice one in front of me so that I can look and see what you're seeing. And uh, it's really bad in the sense that if I'm faced out and the slides are behind me, there's no way I can read the slides. But with this up here, I've got to don't read the slide, talk about the slide. They did a great job. Yeah, they the uh, camera screen. angles are excellent. So nice job, guys. Yeah, so thank you. So yeah, uh, I agree, Lou. And they give, they're giving me a Zoom screen so I can see you as well as you see me. So uh, kind of cool stuff. So we're going to talk about you've got some of this stuff. Maybe you have an HF plus six or a two meter. All of this will apply to 222, 432, et cetera. But I'm not gonna go into those. I decided to stay at two and six because it's something that you could do. And once you become successful at that, you might wanna think about 432. So this is a picture of, uh, this was actually my first two meter antenna on the upper right, a horizontal halo. And the one further down, does that look familiar, John? Well, do you have it? Okay, I couldn't find it in my garage and I, I will admit my garage is a disaster. <laughs> but uh, that's not the picture of the one we have, but it is the one we have. <laughs> I just found the exact same model. These are 
dipole antennas that are pseudo omnidirectional because they wrap the elements around. They're horizontally polarized. For FM, we typically run a vertically polarized, well, everybody runs vertically polarized because it's pretty tough to put a horizontal antenna on your car. But for single sideband, we run horizontal polarization. Noises tend to be polarized in the vertical domain. So the weak signal guys run horizontal to reduce the noise. This is a very simple antenna. You can find various versions uh, similar to the two meter halo is what I call an egg beater. I actually, I bought one at one of the VHF conference ham fests I went to, and it's actually three sets of elements to try to make an omni. So it, it kind of looks like a three leaf clover, but it's an omnidirectional antenna. You'll send a little bit of signal and uh, I use this to uh, this upper antenna, and I've got a slide about it a little later, so I won't totally spoil the story, but uh, my first contact, I lived on the East Coast. I lived in the Hudson Valley of New York, a little town called Poughkeepsie, and kind of near West Point for you military guys. And I hopped on two meter sideband and I worked K1 far out, and he even had a old uh, cassette tape recording, because this was back in the, 70s, 80s, uh, that he had a little bit of reverb and he would go, K1, far out. <laughs> it was very distinctive and he was like 75 miles away. And then I worked this other station that I became involved with, W2SZ, and they were 90 miles. This was this little horizontal halo on two pieces of Radio Shack TV masting. And I had it lashed to one of the uh, wooden posts that held up our front porch overhang. <laughs> you don't technically need a lot, but maybe you wanna put something at your house. Uh, this is what's called a moxin. You can see on the picture on the upper right, there are, there's basically a dipole that's folded back on itself. And then behind it is the reflector. So this is a directional antenna it's fairly small because you can see the, the mast and the pieces. You can buy one from MFJ and 89 bucks if you don't want to build it yourself. But if you do, this is an okay antenna. Go look up on the web and I was trying to find the link but I couldn't get it quickly enough and I didn't get back to it. Uh, John Platt, W0ZQ, did a, ha, presented a really great paper at one of the v, Weak Signal VHF conferences, one that John and I go to called Central States VHF Society. And he published a paper on how to optimize this to get more gain and a better match. So if you're gonna do one of these, you might wanna uh, look that up. You could take this, just disassemble it enough to transport, and you could then put this up on a short piece of mast on your car, if you're gonna go out rover, you know, or just going out to random places and you wanna get on six meters. Uh, small enough antenna that you can do that. Uh, the Moxon is, I wanna say this is less than five feet and this is less than seven feet. So if you had a big van like we have at Rocky Mountain Ham, the QRV, you could transport this thing on the roof platform assembled. But if you're gonna try to run this out of a Mini Cooper or something, you're gonna have to disassemble it. But uh, this is an antenna and I, I have one of these still to this day. This is kind of my mobiling antenna. Uh, it's a little five element Cushcraft. Uh, it's, I don't know what the cost is, probably 150 bucks. It's not the greatest antenna. But do you know what I've worked on this thing? I've worked a lot of stations on it. It has some directivity, but it does have a bit of pedals on the pattern. But that's not necessarily bad when you're just, I used to use this. I had, when I first moved here, a GMC Jimmy. And it had, you know, a little like a Bronco kind of thing, I guess, or 
what's, no, GMC, what's the Chevy uh, Blazer? And it had a tire rack that flipped out and came back in. And I simply mounted a piece of pipe with some brackets on that. And then I had another piece of pipe that just fit over the top. So this thing would be maybe 10 feet above my, on the back of the, the Jimmy. And I've driven up to the top of Pikes Peak and used this and it has some directivity and it didn't have so much that I couldn't just say, I'd look at DX maps or the equivalent and go, the propagation is over there and just aim it and set it and forget it because I used a little rope on the back to tie it down to a rock, but it had enough pedals on the pattern that if somebody was off to the side, I could still hear them and work them without having to jump out of the truck and go and do a rotator. So Justin, you could put one of these in your backyard and we'll see a little bit of ways to do that that don't have to be on the top of a 200 foot tower. And this is a typical, this one is actually up yep, a 144. I think that's a picture of a 220, but this is your basic VHF Yagi. And you can get, I like directive systems, but there's other brands uh, out there. Cushcraft isn't quite as new a design. And, uh, but, uh, Ah, I just noticed. Look at who designed this. K1 far out. He was, he's passed away, he's silent key, but wonderful, wonderfully smart man and uh, did Unix Linux systems for HP, but he got into, he was really big into designs of Yaggies, amplifiers, uh, just gave a lot back to the hobby. He was a great guy. So you can get a Yagi. This one here for two meters is 12 elements. So this is probably going to be about 20 feet long. Boom length, 17 feet. So this is a pretty big, but you could get a three element to start, an eight element. Uh, you can get a number of things. So we talked a little bit about the first contact. So I was telling you about my first contact. It was the horizontal halo, and this is not my rig, but this is a photo of the same type, KLM Multi 2000. You would set the little channel, so one four, you'd set this to four 200, and then you would go up and down 10 kilohertz with this little VXO, and uh, set it for sideband, and make your contact, 10 watts, if you wanted to send CW and you didn't have a key pressed to it, you could push the little test button like a straight key. And if you had to, you hope you had a short call sign if you're gonna do that. But this thing was probably designed in the 1970s because it was a little bit old when I got it. Uh, high, low power, one watt, 10 watts. Do you want the noise blanker on? You always ran it off because it didn't work very well. It just distorted the signal. You had an RF gain control, the very basic things, and you wouldn't use a squelch on sideband, but uh, the very basic things that you needed is for to get on the air. That's what I used, 10 watts. I worked K1FO at 70 miles, W2SZ at 90 miles. Now your mileage may vary, and the batteries are not included. I didn't work a lot of people after that, because that was kind of the capability of my station. I was using this. They were using this. <laughs> this is a photo of W2SZ. That is eight 12 element Yaggies on two meters. They were running a TS830, TS930 to a transverter. And this is actually the subsequent amplifier. That's a 1500 watt amplifier. This is, turns out, this was, I built this for them when I joined. So they were using a little bit earlier transverter and a little bit earlier amplifier. But in order to work from that 10 watt station, they were doing all the heavy lifting. But I worked people. Or pointed at you when you tried. Uh, well, 
what I would do, and there were other stations on to work. There was a lot of activity on two meter single sideband on the East Coast when I was doing this. You would sit there and you would tune your multi 2000 and run the VXO up and down. Oh, there's, I think I hear something. And then you would wait a little bit and you'd hear them working somebody and you'd wait a little bit and then all of, they'd start calling CQ and the signal would come up a little bit. They were turning this antenna. So it's a matter of, could, you, could they hear you off the back of their antenna? Remember I said the GMC Jimmy, the rope? I didn't wanna go out there and pull the rope every time I worked to work a new station. With this, they had to. And so you would wait and all of like five minutes later, the signal would come up. That's when, that's when I made my shot. I had one bullet with this little 10 watt radio. I would make sure that, that it counted. So K1FO, I think only had four Yaggies. Uh, W2SZ had eight, but, uh, but when you can't work anybody anymore on sideband, Wayne's gonna go into what you can do. Let's look at Wayne's early 50 megahertz station. Uh, gotta change the way I do this graphic because it looks like a 1950s station, but he's got a six meter dipole up here and a very inexpensive six meter radio. He's gonna go into this in his talk a little bit, but I, I wanted to give you a sneak peek. Uh, Here's what we did at the Rocky Mountain Ham VHF contest down in, I wanna say Cedardale, Cedar Wood, which is also known as Avondale. But this is an old AT&T building. Right here on the lower right photo, for those of you on Zoom, you can see a, on the far left of that is the AT&T tower that's left over, which we weren't using. Over in the middle of the picture is a small trailer with, I guess that's 18 feet of tower that's basically uh, uh, up about two feet off the ground. So I kind of said that lower Yagi is at about 20 feet above the ground. It's on a little rise. So maybe to the near field, it's maybe 30 feet in the air. It doesn't have to be high. We put it there not because it got us an extra 10 feet, but it got us away from the other antennas. But you can put a six meter Yagi, a Moxon, one of those Cushcrafts. These are directive systems optimized, uh, five element Yaggies. Uh, these I believe were designed by K1RX, uh, who was, was a peer of K1FO and they were both into designing the very best Yagi. This is about the best you can do with five elements on a boom for this length. Uh, I'm sure somebody can come up with a better mousetrap, but you're gonna have to work pretty hard. Great Yaggies, we use two of them. You can see there on this. And for meteor scatter, this antenna is very low. So it has an upward lobe, it has a downward lobe and the downward lobe bounces off the ground and illuminates a different part of the sky than the upward. And we get very good meteor scatter performance from a very low antenna. Now this is not gonna work as well ground wave line of sight. So we had an upper set of antennas that were a little bit higher and uh, clear views in other areas. If I wanted to talk to Denver from down south of Pueblo, I would use this antenna, the upper photo for those of you on Zoom, not the lower uh, trailer antenna. And then we had this little black box in the middle and that was, we actually had a third antenna that we'd put on the QRV2. And we could select any one of these three antennas at the push of a button, or I could select multiple versions. So if I push all three buttons or push the all button, uh, we could send our energy to all three. So I might take one, I might take this low antenna, which is very good for uh, sporadic E, aim it out to the Northeast, take the van mounted antenna, aim it up to Denver and take 
uh, this stack and uh, the upper stack here in the photo and point it out to the West Coast. Now, if I want to switch between East Coast, West Coast, and Denver, it's a push of a button, or I want to call CQ, I'll hit the all button, the yellow button there, and call with energy pointed out in every direction. I'm sending some of my power in an area I don't want, but I'm running a 1500 watt amplifier. I can afford to throw a few watts away in a few other directions. And so this is all basic stuff. You could start with one of these and then go to two, go to four. You can keep building your station. You could do a respectable job Yes. You could do a lot with what we're gonna show you. I'll show you that when you plant Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, we, we have the old joke of uh, when we're out here with this station on six meters, this is just our six meter. We have, I think I have a photo of it, a two meter. That's two Yaggies and 432 two Yaggies in between them. Uh, so we have a decent, it's not the biggest station in the world, but it's a decent sized station for this area. When the bands are open, on six meters here, when the bands are open, we've come just shy of a thousand. I think our highest QSO total was like 980 QSOs. And we had, I think 150 of those grid squares. So when the, when the bands are not open, when six meters are not open, we have higher chances that we will contact a Frisbee with our hand than we will another person on the radio. Because we get the Frisbee out and start to throw it because there's nobody on the radio. On two meters from here, one year I brought out my 1500 watt amplifier that we nicknamed the Chernobyl because we've melted down. We, we put it first on the air during the year the Chernobyl had their meltdown. And we proceeded to melt a type N center pins of a type N connector. I've melted two pieces of hard line, uh, three pieces of RG8 or LMR 400, and two coaxial relays. So we named it the Chernobyl because we keep melting down things. Uh, I brought the Chernobyl out here. Uh, the year before we ran a 100 watt amplifier on two meters and I believe we worked 90 people in about, I don't know, 20 grids. Brought the Chernobyl out the next year. We added another antenna. We worked 92 people. There's not a lot of people to work on traditional. So that's why we're gonna get into these other pieces. So uh, what's best for you? This is all reference material. You can get it on the air. If you wanna get some ideas on antennas, uh, go to, WA5VJB.com, Kent's website. He talks about simple antennas that you can build. Do I? And I kind of have a picture on the next one. He's got some designs about how to take a wooden boom, some welding rod, and build a basic Yagi. Uh, the, uh, I think he said, uh, yeah, he even said it. If you're going to build an Earth Moon Earth, a moon bounce array, this is not the antenna for you. But if you don't have a Yagi and you just want to get something on VHF, this is a great thing. Uh, this is one of his home-built Yagis. He's very fond of these hairpin feeds. Uh, and this is one for satellites. So you could have a, a very simple, I can, I can only imagine the parts cost on this is 50 bucks at most. And you could have an antenna that looks up and works the satellites. It's on his web page. Uh, we talked a little bit about antennas that you can do on, I would recommend just one of these moxins if you have a small yard, otherwise go to this guy. Uh, and there's some pictures of how to put it together. But as I say, John says it's a dummy load, but it does radiate. It does have some directivity and it's easy to take apart and put on the roof rack of your truck or something. On two meters, you could start with a little three element Yagi. It's not a lot of gain. That's kind of like using my horizontal halo, but you're gonna have a little bit of signal squirt, squirting out. The old 
Yaggies that are out there from Directive Systems right now. A five element Yaggy with shipping to here is under two hundred and fifty dollars. There you go. It's phenomenal. They are and, wonderful antennas. And you can probably get an eight element. Uh, here we, you know, is a repeat of the K1FO. Uh, and but maybe someday you'll say, hey, I want something bigger. Uh, this was in our topmost photo was the uh, that antenna on Mount Greylock, and this was an effort that uh, our coordinator up there, Dick, WA2AAU, I guess I got to change that. He's now W2AAU. And that's what we say when we want to get his attention. We go, A, AU. And, uh, but we had these eight Yaggies. It was too big to put up, so we built this Super Yaggie uh, because this, you notice, how do you turn eight Yaggies on a 50 foot tower? You got to rotate the whole darn tower. And that's what this green photo is. That's a B-17 prop pitch motor with a universal joint and a collar at the top that lets the tower spin on its guy wires. And you have to put the guy wires out far enough that they don't hit this lower set of Yaggies. This thing took two men about eight hours of work in parallel to put up. And we did it for a weekend. It was just too big, so we built these new Super Yaggies that didn't have boom supports in uh, 1985. Wow, okay. That didn't have boom supports, had a lot of gain. Four of these could do moon bounce. And uh, so it's just in here if you ever wanted to see. Uh, these are the actual antennas out at uh, Cedarwood. N0, I said, Rocky Mountain Ham. Our two meter antennas are on the top and the 432 is in the middle. I think we were putting 220 on a different tower this year. That's true. Uh, but here are, you know, if, okay, uh, we wanted some antennas and this is a mid sized station. So, Let's talk about a few of the insane, and then we'll be, we're about 9.30, uh, finish this and then take a break. Are we about ready? Okay. So let's talk about some insane stations. <laughs> uh, this on the far left is actually both W2SZ in Massachusetts and N0SZ here. These are five and six element, six meter antennas placed uh, up for a weekend. And if one antenna is good, two is better. On the, to the right, well, if two is better, four is even better. And they set, we set these up such that the upper two could go one direction and the lower two could go the other direction. We even did a phasing box such that if these were all aimed in the same direction, we could electrically elevate slightly to illuminate a different portion of the e-skip or the scattering clouds. So, but you can start with one of these that's smaller, build to a larger, go to more antennas if you find this interesting. Uh, one of our guys, one of our directors, Jeff Carrier always talks about it's mo beta. Well, one end is good, two is great, four to eight, it's mo beta. Uh, so, the eight element that we were looking at on two meters on the far left is eight Yaggies on 220. And I just realized in this photo, on the left photo, right at the bottom, you can see the old 432 antenna. That is 16 432 Yaggies, all mounted. We used to call that the bed spring because it was mounted on a grid and they were all aimed out. They were end mount Yaggies. Uh, very easy to put up because that whole thing broke into two pieces and transported up. We put the two pieces together, put it on a tower and we were done. All the phasing lines were ladder line and in there and very quick and easy antenna, but big antennas that you can do. Uh, you can get even crazier. This is Dick Nadel, K2RIW in Long Island. This was in his backyard in Long Island. 16 Yaggies and that whole thing could 
pivot on the top and push out to do moon bounce. So he could aim the antennas from the horizon up into the sky and do single sideband moon bounce with this thing. You can really get crazy. And Dave Blachley, W5UN, 32 Yaggies plus 32 Yaggies. He, he's got the, the initial set of Yaggies horizontally polarized, 32 of them. And then he said, well, but occasionally when I send a signal off the moon and up to the moon and it bounces, the polarization rotates when it comes back as it's going through the atmosphere and bouncing off the moon. So he has 32 smaller antennas vertically polarized that he can switch between. So he can listen for, he'll always transmit horizontal because it's more power because he, he's got bigger Yaggies on the horizontal. But if he needs to, he can say on my receiver, I'm gonna kick in the, the verticals. And if it's a stronger signal, he listens to it there. <laughs> Insane kind of people. Yep. The, uh, when I lived on the East Coast, we had a 30 foot dish and we would occasionally change out the feed for a high efficiency feed and run that off the moon. Uh, another friend of mine had a 30 foot, this was a facility at GE at their corporate research center. But a friend of mine had a 30 foot dish in his backyard, a 30 foot solid dish and he ran moon bounce on it. But I think the best I ever heard of is somebody took one of these little, I call them Grisham novel radios, three watt radios. And I think they had a little amplifier to bring it up a few watts. And they brought it up with them in the feed car at Arecibo. And they, they were right there at the, at the feed and 100 watts at Arecibo, it just was dominating signal on the moon. Uh, so, uh, are we done yet? Uh, Why are you spending all of this money on antennas? Why don't you just run more power? Well, I can't receive with better with more power, but Willem's got to, and I guess you guys could hear him, uh, so I don't need to repeat the question, but why don't we just run more power? If I'm running the 10 watts, it means W2SZ and K1FO has to run 1500 to make up for my weaknesses. But if you're gonna run moon bounce, you all have to run enough power to hear, your, hear the signal coming back. Except if you're on single sideband, you're gonna need at least four Yaggies and at least a kilowatt and a very low noise receiver to hear that signal bouncing off the moon. If you're on JT44, or well, the moon bounce version is JT something else. JT65. It's now getting to the point of like, we have so many protocols uh, in the digital world, uh, you know, for video H264 and all this stuff. Now it's getting that way with uh, JT, uh, the amateur radio protocol, but you can take what, took four to eight Yaggies and 1500 Watts and have the same communication as we're gonna see after our break with a uh, hundred Watts to a pair of Yaggies off the moon. It's pretty incredible. So I threw in here, we're not gonna go through these. Uh, this is where I said I was stealing from previous. Uh, last year I did a talk on uh, antennas and gain. So we have the gut feel rules on antenna gain. I'm gonna go very, uh, I stole some of this material from some person called WB2 Kiss My Yagi. I figured we're talking about Yaggies. I should talk about Kiss My Yagi. And yeah, that was my old call that I changed in 1996. Would you wanna be Kiss My Yagi to this day? Nah, I'll take AD. Uh, but uh, isotropics, test and measurement, how to check your antenna to make sure it's working properly. You can go through these. 
Uh, there's a return loss calculator versus Viswar, and there are the formulas. Uh, how do you know if you've got a good uh, antenna gain? Well, if you're building your own, if you really get into this and you're building your antennas and you want to know, come to a Central States VHF conference or a West Coast or an East Coast, and we'll measure. We can measure it there. Uh, if you're going to stack your antennas, and again, this is N0 SZ and Pueblo, uh, we use these power dividers uh, that are available. You can build them or you can buy them. Impedance transformers. You can do six meter. That's the two meter, but I'm really recommend this on six meters. If you're at a, exactly at a quarter wave, you can tee it. And if you're more than a quarter wave, you add some 50 ohm with your 75 ohm cable. So you can put these together. You can do four antennas. A uh, little bit on Yaggies we talked about. Driven elements for Yaggies. If you're trying to work on one, you can pull this up and get some reference. Uh, the T-match. If you get as far as microwave, uh, you've, got a, you've got a dish. You got a, somebody gives you an old two foot, three foot, four foot dish. You need a feed for it. Grab one of these little printed wire board feeds that's uh, a log periodic design. This is from Kent WA5VJB, that, that first slide I showed. Just some reference on a FM Yagi that I looked at. It's no longer made, but just gives some theory towards these things. Are we done yet? <laughs> so how am I doing on time? 9.41. Questions, thoughts, is this making sense? Totally put, I, I haven't, I don't see anybody in the room here that's totally to sleep. Ted has not even blinked at me on Zoom here the whole time, nor has Dave. I haven't seen him blink once, but the rest of you guys are not. Oh, and Steve is on here. Can't see him through the sunglasses on the little rodent there. But uh, what, what, what are you, so I have $500 yeah. that I can spend on my station. What do you recommend I get first? What do you have? Or, and that's a, that's a great question. So the answer to that is, what do you have and what do you want to do? If you want to get started, I think the best thing would be to try some six meters on the magic band, as they people call it, and try to work some single sideband, and then work some WSJT, weak signal JT, Joe Taylor. The guy that wrote, originally wrote all of this software that runs from your computer through a gentleman named Joe Taylor, K1JT. He's a fascinating, fascinating man to talk to. He is a PhD. He is at least a professor of physics at Princeton. I think he may be head of the department, uh, but incredibly smart monster mind is someone once wrote about people like that. He's just one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever spoken to. And he's humble and he'll explain things at any level. He wrote this software. He now has a lot of his graduate students <laughs> writing it all. Willem, do you do all your own work or do you have your grad students do some for you? You know, <laughs> but <laughs> Joe is teaching these students about radio technology, modulation, signal links through his students through this software. And he gives it away to ham radio for free. The man's won a Nobel Prize. That's the kind of, and uh, we, we've chatted with him. I think John has met him and he, he does the software. So I would say, if you have an HF plus six meter radio, build a basic antenna, whether it's a halo like John and I have used or a moxin or a dipole, try to work a few people on six meters, use DX maps to see that the band is open. And then after you've worked both stations that you can from your, from your home, I kind of joke, both stations, you know, there's going to be a limited number of people. 
hook your rig up as Wayne's going to go into after this and work the digital modes. John, how many people can you work from your house on sideband on a typical weekend? Like both stations, right? Yeah. How many can you work on JT44, JTXX? It's a little bit different technology. And some people will say, well, that's not ham radio. OK, you're letting a computer do the work as opposed to your ear. But you're communicating over a different distance. If this was an absolute emergency, could we communicate something using that mode? It's going to be slow, but the answer is yes. We could get communication through, and that's the ham radio side. If you're of interest, the next step I would say is look for an inexpensive two meter sideband radio or pick up a used transverter at a ham fest when we eventually get them back. Shameless plug, we're gonna have the February 20th. ARA swap fest, February 20th. Oh, I forget your, your, your mic so they can hear you. So say it again. Uh, are you on, on your mic? I am now. Oh, you are now. So February 20th. 2022, the Swap Fest, Adams County Fairgrounds. Okay. That's the Swap Fest that we all do with the ARA, Rocky Mountain Ham, and uh, usually Cherry Creek Youth. Are they active at this point? Okay, so they're really not active, but it was with the Cherry Creek Youth group. And uh, there may be a Ham Fest in January at Northern Colorado. They're gonna try to hold theirs. I don't know if we're having any fall in the Denver Metro. Uh, so those, those are gonna be the first ones. Uh, you might be able to find a transverter there or online. And I would say start with two meters single sideband and you will be amazed at some of the people you can work. And uh, there, so. Yes, the old antenna. Yeah, you're not Mike. He's saying uh, Dave W6OAL, Dave Klingerman. And he has a good line on some of these kind of things. He can actually help you build an antenna or sell you a home built custom. His very affordable, uh, very affordable. And yep, right here in Parker. So any other questions before we go to a break? Uh, it is currently. 947, do you want them to come back at 955 or 10 o'clock? What do you say, Professor? Okay. 10 o'clock, we'll come back because if it's my, my you're turn online to and you want to chat with I'm us. I'm Wayne in zero POH. And uh, I've been with Rocky or does Mountain anybody Ham for quite so many years. And I got into Rocky Mountain Ham through weak signal, VHF, and UHF. Uh, Mr. Maxwell here was uh, part of the original Rocky Mountain VHF contest group, as were quite a few of the uh, other members of Rocky Mountain Ham Radio. And it started out with contesting in the June contest. And that was, uh, I think, the first couple of contests that I talked to you guys was back in uh, the late 90s. And it, it was a, a, an interesting time because I was just getting into this and being that uh, I was just married for a couple of years and you got to spend money and uh, you know how that goes. Anyway, what I'm going to do is look primarily at the six meter magic band. That's my, actually my favorite band. And we're going to get into uh, quite a bit about WSJT, Joe Taylor's software. And, uh, that's where a lot of things are going these days, is digital. A little bit of review, what Doug was up, up to. We've got propagation on six, You've got line of sight up to maybe 100 miles. Your e-skip, single hop, between three and 1,200 miles. This generally occurs April through August, and then again, December through January but don't let that fool you. It can happen at any time. 
more common in the morning and the evening. Sporadic E. It's sporadic. It'll come, it'll go. It's also sporadic because for some, re for some it's very unpredictable as to the amount and to the strength of the layer that it's bouncing off of. Uh, one of the things is it can bounce off a thunderstorm, right? You can bounce off a thunderstorm. And that storm may be over Indianapolis when you're working it from here. So that could it, very well be. That's one of the hard to predict parts. That's part of the hard to predict. And it comes and it goes. And the E cloud, the E ionization cloud actually moves around. And as it moves around, you're going to get some really good propagation. You're right in the middle of talking to somebody and they disappear. And that's a lot of the sporadic E. You've got E layer multi hop and F2. 1,200 miles and up to transoceanic distances. Not quite as common as your uh, single hop. Same time periods is when it occurs. It does very widely location to location. In fact, I have seen times when I've got excellent skip from here to the East Coast, and I'm also doing some uh, internet stuff with some friends of mine about 150 miles south, they've got absolutely nothing. The intensity does vary from location to location. And once again, sporadic, it's unpredictable, and it changes. Another type of uh, propagation that Doug mentioned was meteor scatter. That's usually good 200 to 1400 miles out, sometimes a little closer, sometimes a little farther. It depends on the number of meteors that are in the sky at any given time. It can occur any time, but pre-dawn and dusk hours are generally the best when you've got the most meteors in the sky. It can be very, very productive for known meteor showers. There's, uh, we just went through the Perseids, which was back in August. Leonids will be coming up here in November. And that's the time when uh, the meteor scatter is the most uh, productive as far as number of contacts you can make. Does vary in intensity from location to location. Now you can use a variety of modes on six meters. Everything is supported by all types of provocation. Sideband, CW, FM, and digital all work fine when you're dealing with your, uh, your local line of sight. When eSkip, the best way is to use sideband and CW when you've got good solid eSkip, because you can make a contact a lot quicker, make an exchange a lot quicker, especially during your contest, by using those two methods. When the quality of the eSkip is poor, and or it's very, very erratic, that's when we move on to digital. For meteors, sideband and CW used to be the thing. Uh, Doug mentioned the high speed CW. They used to send it, you'd send your CD, your CW, then you'd use software to speed it up, speed it up to 120 words a minute. And then you'd send these bursts and the guy at the other end would obviously slow it down until he could copy it and see what you could get. After Joe Taylor came on the scene, most meteors, almost all meteor scatter, I don't know anybody these days who's doing CW or USB. I mean, USB used to be like uh, K1 AD or K2 AD Enzo POH, K2 AD Enzo POH. And you do that for 15 seconds, and then you listen for 15 seconds. There you go. That used to be meteor scatter. This is the picture that Doug showed you earlier. And that was my first six meter rig, the IC505. 10 watt all mode. I picked it up from N0LL out in Smith Center, Kansas. 
Uh, he's one of the people that uh, is very active on VHF Plus. Oh yeah, Meteor Scatter, he's on every single day. There's my first six meter antenna. That's a half wave dipole, up uh, about 15 feet or so, off a little stick that was stuck up from the uh, side peak, and the other half ran out to the chimney. And you also see my uh, whopping big 13B2 Cushcraft, and my uh, other one was a Cushcraft as well. I don't remember how many elements was on that little bitty 432 Stinger. That was the contest station that actually won the awards that you will see on the wall, the pink ones up above the shelves. I actually placed uh, as the single op low, uh, single op low power uh, Rocky Mountain Ham Division and state of Colorado a couple of years using that station in the 1990s. Now, today's equipment, we've already gone through it, transceivers, you've got your HF through six, uh, you can get them new, you can get them used, you can find it on the swap list, eBay and other outlets. You can add a transverter, that'll get you up on six and all the higher bands. For antennas, you can start out remembering they're always horizontally polarized, as Doug went through. You can do a homebrew dipole. And one thing is these can be mounted inside attics. And you have halos. They could also be mounted inside of an attic. So if you're covenant controlled, these antennas are small enough to get up there and get you on the air. And you don't have to worry about the HOA police. You got small ones like the one I had on the chimney mount, light duty rotator. My rotator was a Radio Shack uh, little baby thing about the A big by the A big by the A big. Uh, I still have that rotator and I just got done putting a uh, Wellbrook uh, receive loop on it and mounting it in my backyard. This slide here from 1997 through 2000. That's when I was running the ICOM and the dipole. What you're seeing there is your, there's your line of sight. Those are the people I could work during a contest without any skip whatsoever. The rest of the yellow grids are the ones that I added to my grid collection between 97 and 2000, which qualified me for uh, the ARRL VUCC, which is 100 grids as a minimum. And I got that with that equipment. The ones you see in yellow were worked that way. The ones out here, those are the ones that were pretty much uh, double hop e skip. In fact, one of those was K8GP, which is the uh, grid pirate contest station. And like Doug pointed out, those guys had humongous stations. Therefore, they could hear my sideband with 10 watts in a dipole. Moving on, 2021 or 2001, I put up the tower. I have a whopping big 35 foot tower in my backyard. And on that, I put a five element M squared beam. And I didn't have enough money to get any more power. Uh, that took all the budget I had. I took all the budget that my wife, Joan, KB0YRX, would let me have. Fortunately for me, she has a ticket. She kind of understands. So as you can see, the ones that I added to my VUCC are there in orange. There's. That, that's correct. Now, if you look at the uh, line of sight, you'll see that circle grew. And I can do a little bit more with the beam and 10 watts. You can also look out into, into the ocean out there at the end of my, uh, my map. 
those are some of the grids that I was able to work with five watt or 10 watts and the five element beam. That was a particularly good year for sunspots. I also worked all of these during that year. And that was a 6M5X and 10 watts. Puerto Rico, Alaska, Newfoundland, Hawaii, Japan. And then we also, I also worked my first European, Scotland. And I added quite a few grid squares that year. What did I put, what did I do on there? No, both of, all of Newfoundland is, almost all of Newfoundland is Gulf November. Lunch, you owe me lunch. <laughs> now Fox, Fox November 38. Yeah, that's, that's closer in because um, I had a good buddy of mine uh, from Broadcast Band DX that I actually worked on six meters one year. He was Gulf November, I believe he was in 37. But yeah, now those, those are up into the Maritimes. Right, they're in the, into the Maritimes. Now, what I did manage to do is I added a brick to my 10 watts and my uh, five element uh, Yagi, 2002 to 2020. Everything that you see in purple was added during those years. That took me up to uh, somewhere around 500 and some grid, 525 grids. Um, anybody who remembers the bomb cyclone that came through here in 19, 2019, Took me off the air for two years. Took and twisted everything else uh, up. Took my long boom two meter Yagi and broke it in half. Uh, needless to say, I ended up having to get with the insurance company and beat them over the head, get some money and come back up. And I didn't actually get back on the air until 2021, which was this past year. You'll notice in this one, I got 100 watts now. You can take a look at the circle for line of sight. Those grids that I added in this time period were all on sideband. And then again, there's some more uh, double hop reaching out into the Maritimes. Here's the donut hole. The donut hole is the area that you have no propagation to get to. It's too close for e-skip, and it's too far for line of sight. So with Joe Taylor around, we moved into FSK441 back in 2009. I want to say that was WSJT4, which was a rather early version of it. What you're looking at in green were all meteor scatter contacts using the digital mode. Okay, now I got kind of squinted at that one. This is what I've added using FT8 for 2021. And you can see the ones in there, they're in a, kind of that ochreish, greenish color. Those are what I added with FT, uh, FT8 this past year. And then this past year, since I got back on, MSK144 is the successor to FSK441. That's a digital mode. Didn't add a whole bunch, but that's primarily because I don't need a whole bunch right now. In fact, I was lucky. N0LL uh, ran a de-expedition to EN07, and uh, KN4JX ran a de-expedition down to uh, EN, or e, yeah, EM, 06 and 05. 
And I just happened to run into two other guys for uh, DM92, and the other one should be uh, Echo Mike 02 or 04, and I'm still missing 03. Got to get somebody in there. Yes, I am. Nobody's worked up there in years. That, that's right. In fact, there is a lot of people. There are a lot of people in the in the six meter and above community are waiting for Rocky Mountain Ham to run up to Delta November eight zero. Uh, George W one XE used to run up there and run the contest up there from the Pawnee National Grasslands. It's one of the most sought after grids for the Fred Fred Fish Memorial Award. That's um, a ARRL award for working all of the grids in the continental United States. There's 480 of them. And as you can see, I'm not missing a whole bunch because this is where I am today. I've got, uh, I believe it's 460 of them and I got about 28 to go. Um, this is what I've worked from May when I got back on the air this year through September of 2021, these were all worked with FT8. 283 grids, 63 grids. Uh, blue was MSK, that's the, the, the meteor scatter. Now, if you take a look at this, you'll see that I worked a total of 525 grids in the previous 23 years. In other words, I worked 50% of what I've worked in my entire six meter career last year, just this past season. So that's why we're gonna talk about weak signal by Joe Taylor software. Basically what he, they have done is they've written, and I'm gonna use they because Joe started it, it's got his name on it, but he's got a cadre of people working with him now that are helping him improve and come up with, like Doug said, more and more digital modes. We've got a bunch of them. I think there's like 10 or 12. It's all free. Exactly. And what this can do, it can actually read signals 10 dB below the audible threshold. So it means you ain't hearing anything in your speaker, but you're seeing something on your screen. In addition to the transceiver, you're gonna need a computer and a computer to transceiver interface. Uh, a few of the commercially available uh, interfaces. Tire link, uh, they have the uh, Signal link, that's what it is. I can't quite read it from here. And I can't read it here because I ran out of the house so quick this morning, I forgot my computer glasses. That's uh, John Maxwell's favorite. That's what he's using this morning for his uh, meteor scatter stuff. And this one right here is a rig blaster. It's an older one made by West Mountain Radio. The reason I like this one is it can do two radios and I have my HF plus six on one side, and I have a TS2000X on the other side, and I can run two meter meteor scatter with that. Plus it also has a ability to put a mic into it. So you can just switch back and forth between uh, your uh, analog voice and your digital, and you're controlling it all from one console. To get started, choose the operating system. WSJT works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. You can download the software free. Emphasize again, free. There's the website. I've also got some references at the end. Install the software. Bada bing, bada boom. There we are. I'm going to do FT8 first. So we're going to look at a waterfall screen. 
and we've got our main window. First thing you have to do, go to File, go to Settings, fill in some required things, starting with My Call and My Grid. Very important, because without that, nobody's going to know who you are. Then we've got some other preferences. I'm not going to have to scoot up here really quick and pull this over here so I can kind of see what we've got because I don't remember them. Oh, let's see. Display distance in miles. That's an important one that I like to use. Uh, also, turn your transmitter off after you hear 73. You don't want to keep sending 73 to people. And then the other one is turning on the VHF, UHF uh, enhancements. Because if you're running this on HF, you don't necessarily have to have those features turned on. The last one is a timeout timer. Because once you start transmitting, you don't want to con continue to transmit uh, if you forget that you actually turned it on. And I've actually done that before. Um, WSJT has CAT support for a lot of radios. That's my 756 Pro 3 right there. There's all your CAT information. Stick all that stuff in. And on this side, you've got all your transceiver to computer interface parameters. You need to fill those in. Obviously, you're going to have to refer back to your manual. And this is one time where paying the manual or reading the manual does pay off. Then there's some other settings, and you can go through the uh, various help documents available, and there's a lot of them for WSJT. And it'll give you some hints on how to fill some of the stuff in. A lot of it is going to depend on the rig that you're actually using. There are two test buttons, which is great. You go in there, put your stuff in, hit the test button. It's going to tell you whether or not you've got everything configured for your cat, whether or not you have everything configured for your interface to the transceiver. Sound card parameters. Serious question. What if you have a dog instead of a cat? What if you've got an old dog radio that doesn't have a computer-aided whatever they call it, that's optional. You don't have to have that to that's, make this work. But correct. if you do have a modern radio, it'll set the frequencies and all that stuff. But if you got an old dog radio, you can still use it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. There's uh, your default directories after you set your sound card up. One of the things that's really nice is you can actually save your decodes for all your QSOs and play them back as WAV files. And the one no nice thing about that is you can use those to make presentations like this one when you're all done. WSJT does have a built-in logging program. Uh, there's other applications that are add-ons get to that near the end, that will actually allow you to log a QSO and then upload that QSO to Logbook of the World in real time. So you work the guy, you take care of this, you take care of that, bada bing, bada boom, you're up at LOTW. Okay, some of the other tabs that we've got, uh, TX macros, that lets you create and save custom transmit messages. A lot of these are pre-formatted pre uh, to kind of uh, allow for standardization. And then from there, you can also get, go in and use this feature. The frequencies list is the bands and the common calling frequencies for the um, WSJT uh, FT8 operation. This works with the uh, rig control functions. And like when you switch if you're if you've got this set up properly and you've got cat every time you switch bands 
The logger is going to be able to log the right frequency, the light, right band. You don't have to do anything at all. Or this is all preloaded. Colors. Um, what one of the things they do that is really nice is if your call, which is in the my call that we filled in earlier, when it sees your call, it'll show up as an orangish red on your screen. Well, that no, that lets you know that somebody did just answer your uh, your CQ. And these are some other ones that I use. Uh, CQ is green and your transmitted uh, messages are in yellow, which is kind of nice to have so that it sticks out from the rest of the, uh, the screens. There's a couple of options here under advanced. I keep my uh, bandwidth for the application. I keep that 100 hertz larger than the 2.8 kilohertz filter that's on my rig. 2.8 is what I use uh, when I'm running on FT8. As you get into some of the other modes, you do have to go in and change the filter that you're using because you're going to be narrowing things down as we go into some of the other modes. It's got a really nice feature for contesting, for field day, and there's contest modes actually built into it. So like when we did field day uh, back in June, we had it set up in the QRV. We've got it set up with contest mode, got your grid squares entered. Everything is what I like to call street legal for contesting. And you can tell during uh, field day that the person who didn't have their mode set on and their uh, messages filled out properly, they weren't sending the appropriate uh, ARRL section because it wasn't loaded properly. So you want to keep that in mind if you're going to use this for contesting. That's the basic setup. Once you've got your setup done, you want to put that away. Hit OK. There you have it. After we got the setup done, it actually appears as default in the little window. So we take that and we rename that setting to whatever you want. I've got my icon and that's where I have the uh, cat configuration for the icon rig. Uh, my TS2000, I don't run I, uh, cat on it. So when I want to switch over to two meters for meteor, I've got the one that I renamed no rig and that one there comes up the one thing that is kind of interesting about this is if you bring up the one with your rig and you didn't turn your rig on, it will come up and it'll give you an error message after a period of time and shut WSJT down because it wants to find that rig. So it, you can make that mistake, but sooner or later you learn, turn the rig on before you bring up WSJT. Let's see here. View accesses a variety of forms that are up there. Most of these are used with the EME capable um, modes. Uh, one of them, which is fast graph, we'll see in a bit, that's used with uh, meteor scatter with the MSK. As Doug said, we're getting more and more and more modes. The latest one in here, I believe, is Q, Q65, which is actually a successor to JT65. And it's designed for uh, extremely weak uh, EME reception, extremely weak uh, ionospheric reception. So Wayne, uh, and I don't know, Dave said my mic wasn't up on, are we? Okay, uh, where do you go to get a quick lookup table such that I know when to run JT4 versus JT9? Good question. In fact, we'll get to that in about two more slides. Okay, I will stand. 
you get an opportunity to select your decode speed. Deep is the one that you usually use if you've got marginal FT8, which usually means marginal e-skip. And the others are used with EME and meteor scatter. This is where you can save your session. You save it as a WAV file and play it back. Or in this case, it helped me make this presentation. Tools, these are all various routines that were built in, most of which are for use with JT65, moon bounce, and now also Q65 for uh, moon bounce. To answer that question, here you go. The books of the WSJT Bible. In this help, you have got everything under the sun. The, mo the, the most important one is to bring down the, the help, the, the main help document, the manual. You go through the manual, and that thing is a lot of pages. There's a lot of stuff to absorb. But that's the one that's going to say, you want to do EME? You want to use this, which is usually JT65. And now they're going to Q65. It goes through Meteor Scatter. And the I want to say the nuances of the various types of applications built in for the other propagation. Very important place to remember, because anything you want to know, especially something I haven't covered, it's going to be in there. So this is where it all is. But if they're HF plus six radio, and they're going to get started on their very first one, where are they going to start? Probably help. FT8 though. F, well, FT8 for the you're moon. You're going to go yes. to help, but you're going to look at your FT8 help as your first step, your first baby step in getting started. Correct. Once you, once you've gone through and done your configuration that we walk through under settings. Settings comes first. Then you want to go in and see how to set yourself up for FT8, which is pretty good, Doug. Because now that we're all set for FT8, let's go and see how we're going to set ourselves up to do FT8 on six meters. Okay, we've got a little, some little boxes up there on the waterfall grid. The green area is your primary receive indicator. The codes from the green area they're going to go over and be in that received area. FT8 looks first in that little green area where your frequency is listed. So wherever you've got your frequency set, that's where it's going to look first. Then it will look throughout the rest of your pass band or band pass. All the things it decodes will appear on the band activity. Transmit is in red. That is the where your specific FT8 uh, transmission is going to occur. There's your transmit frequency down there. That frequency is in hertz from your center to the edge of your uh, passband. You're always in upper sideband. So as you can see, I've got that scrolled out to, uh, that should be about 4K. Most people are running below 3K. Um, and that's the general passband for FT8. Above zero, needs to be above zero so you have audio, to approximately 2.8 to 3 kC. And that's the passband in which you will find all of the signals that pop up.
There's your re receive frequency. That's where the green is. And that's your major receive. But it's going to receive everything within that passband that's strong enough to decode. This time, I'll show we've got uh, TX first is checked. That means we're going to be the one transmitting for the first 15 seconds. Auto sequence is on. That actually lets the program do the walking through the uh, transmissions you're going to be making. Call first responds to the first decode containing my call. So if two or three people respond to your CQ, the first one it gets, that's who it's going to start talking to right away. There are six meters calling frequency. The main calling frequency, there are two, is 50.313. Here is how you make sure your levels are set so you can decode. When you're at idle and there's no signal, you need to set the volume on your transceiver so that you're about 30 dB on the little sliding scale. When signals are present, you want to try and keep your volume control down off of 80 dB. If you get, start to get more than 80 dB, you're going to start to get distortion, and that's going to keep the signals from decoding. So, and those colors are accurate when you're in the zero to under 80, it's going to be green. If you start bouncing over 80, the indicator will turn red. This time, uh, we've got the radio button. It's checked for CQ. We've already clicked on the transmit and we're sending CQ. And there's our transmitting signal is showing up there in yellow because I set the yellow earlier. You don't necessarily have to have your transmitted messages showing up. I find that that's a good thing because if you really get to a point where you've got a lot of signals and you're making contacts at a rapid pace, the auto may not be doing what you want. You might want to turn that auto off and control with your mouse which radio button you're using, which part of the sequence you're, you're needing to send. That way, if you happen to think you're replying to somebody, but the button is still on CQ, um, It'll correct that. Here's one AB0YM Rover. And these, these are all cuts from uh, the September contest. Responded to my CQ. And like it says at the top, this is a reenactment. So the times and the frequencies don't necessarily match. The decode appears in both of the windows, it appears in the general activity and in the receive area. Since auto sequence is turned on, it is already advanced to the next uh, transmission that we need to make where we're going to acknowledge that we have actually received AB0YM's transmission. At this point, I'm sending an R to acknowledge receiving his grid, and I'm sending my grid. That's because I have this set up in contest mode. Like I said, this was during the September VHF contest. AB0YM responds with RR73. By using RR73, he's indicating he doesn't want you to send anything back. I've sent my, my uh, Rogers. And 7-3, we've, we're done. There's also a setting for RRR. And RRR, that's where the operator actually wants a 73 back. 
because he's not going to assume that you actually got that last transmission. We use RRR primarily in meteor scatter, where you're going to sit there and send a lot of stuff. That's FT8 and setting it up. And FT8, by the way, is a really, really popular mode now on all the HF bands. Uh, there's a lot of people using it. And uh, I have actually gotten back into using HF because <laughs> I can use this. And the bands are not quite as dead as they have been. I've got a question, Wayne. I mean, um, I may have missed it here, uh, but from the contest mode, and that's what's always kind of confused me, you know, with this uh, is, you know, in the documentation that you alluded to, does it talk about, you know, what is, you know, in the contest mode, what is globally accepted or, you know, what should you put in and where when you do a contest like field day or, or some of this, is that, is some of the documentation you referenced include that? Yeah, everything for the contest mode is actually in the WSJT manual. It's, it's in that uh, the huge document, which you can read that online as an HTML or download it as a PDF. Okay, and then the second question, I, I know when we did some field day this year, it was set up for some of the auto logging and some different things as well. Uh, what, do you use auto logging or what would you recommend uh, that uh, one would get started to, to use it if you wanted it to auto log when you did complete a um, contact? The auto, auto logging looks for 7.3 in the response from the station you're working. If you turn auto logging on, it will go out and auto log if you send somebody RR73. I don't, they had it turned on at RM Ham. I don't recommend it. And the reason I'm saying that is I turned my auto logging off for the September VHF contest because, like I said earlier with the, uh, with the e skip, it can be very sporadic. So I'm sitting there and I'm working guys in Chicago, uh, Indianapolis, and I'm working these guys on eSkip in September, and that's pretty sporadic. Well, if I send somebody RR73, it automatically gets logged. And then the next transmission I see from him, he's sending me back his R and his grid square because he didn't get my Roger. So I went to using RRR. I turned auto logging off. No, excuse me. I actually, I, I kept using RR73, but I turned auto logging off. If he didn't come back and ask for my grid square again, I'd log it. Now, and there is one in there to prompt you to log. It doesn't just auto log, it prompts you to log. I generally do the prompt. The prompt, because if you go ahead and do the prompt, then you can override it and you can continue that QSO until you get to the point where it's actually complete. And the, it, some of the more nuanced things. Anyone else have anything before we actually go on to like MSK? Has had is if sporadic E is so short lived, how do you live with the 30 second turnaround time on FT8? Live with the, the 30 second turnaround time on FT8. Uh, well, it's about the shortest interval that they, being Joe Taylor and the people who've worked on this, it's the shortest interval that they have decided would actually allow for the decodes. There you go. If it gets five seconds out of the 30 seconds, that's enough to decode? 
Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Isn't there a 15 second mode? Yeah, <clears throat> FT4. FT4, yeah. Seven and a half. Yeah, for FT4. seven and a half. Well, when you, when I say it, the, the 15s, you've got 15 on, and that's your send. FT4, which they also call contest mode, it's basically the same as FT8, except for the seven and a half sec second send receive. Um, I've also seen people go to FT4 when it gets really, really intense and we want to actually split up frequencies, especially openings like um, we had some great openings. I know John was in on them too, uh, into Europe. And it was like, these guys were coming at me so fast. I'd have three or four red lines of people answering my CQ from Europe. And I'm trying to work them one right after the other. And a lot of people moved over to FT4. I stayed with FT8, but a lot of people went to FT4 and stayed on FT4 because that is on another frequency and allows for uh, just more people to get on there without stepping all over each other. So you mentioned one frequency, 50.313, and everybody stepping over each other, but everybody in the country is on that same frequency. That's correct. But are they really on that same frequency? And you were getting into the 2.7, 2.8, and I don't know if everybody here in the room and on Zoom really picked up on that. Uh, well, it was something that I had a lot of trouble conceptualizing, even with all the time I've spent on weak signal until I actually got out there to field day and started. I don't know if others were kind of a little confused by that as well. You may want to. What go into I can a little kind of sort of point out a bit, and I'm going to have to have Mr. Cameraman. I'm, I'm going to actually stand up and do something this time. I want to grab a mic here to help a little bit. Here, too. Yeah. here is the signal for AB0YM. There is his, his signal right there. That signal takes up as wide as my fingers. You've all got, all got all the way up here to roughly 3,000. It's basically 500 to about, yeah, your radio is usually pretty good between 300 or 3,000 and 3,500. Yeah. That's hertz. Okay. Yeah, that's so all hertz. The signal that you're seeing, your center may be on 50.313. That's going to put you at the center of whatever this window is that you have here. So 50.313 is gonna be where the little red and green marks are on the screen. Because he's set to no, 1605. That is set to 1605. Correct. So you're at 50.313 plus, plus 1605. Hertz. Hertz. So it's gonna, it's gonna put you here plus there. Whatever that frequency is. This transmit hertz adds to the frequency on the dial on your radio. When you see all of these people coming in, you could have red in waterfall <laughs> from 3,500 to 500. Yep. It's insanity trying to pick these things out. WSJT does its best to try to pull it out. But when you want to pick a place to park and call, do your due diligence. Try to fit yourself in a hole somewhere. Yeah, what you'll see, and unfortunately, I couldn't really accomplish this doing this uh, the way it had to do it with screenshots, is if you look real close up around where the, um, is this got a pointer on it? It does, but you won't ever see it. Yeah, uh, right there. Yeah, you see right the there, right and there's, here. there's, you see where that blue is right there? That blue means there's nobody there. This red over here, that's AB0YM. And he's here. 
and he's up and in you'll here. You'll see he's from 2,500 all the way down here to about 1,700. Yeah. He was pretty wide. So you want to transmit where you don't have anybody in red. That's hard to do when you've got local signals too, because you're going to have a giant splatter yeah. associated with that signal. So John and Wayne, isn't this kind of a case of a man with one watch knows what time it is. A man with two is never quite sure. Yeah. So because says, yeah. a I, man with one watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches never yeah. really knows. I think I have my mic on. Okay. So uh, we, my radio I've set to 50.313. And I'm exactly on that frequency, correct? Well, maybe not. You set yours to 50.313. But maybe mine in reality, if I go to a NIST standard, is 5313.1. And yours is dot zero. We're going to be at different places, and then I have this sixteen oh five. Does everybody always have to run sixteen oh five? No, you can pick whatever you want. I may want to shift mine down because I'm seeing a lot of stuff, and other people. Ultimately, Wayne said, "How wide is your sideband filter on your receiver?" Exactly. If you go in. Now I've got an Elecraft that it's variable. If I take my window down to a thousand Hertz, I'm not looking at that whole window anymore. I brought myself yeah. down a great That's deal. Right. You're gonna squeeze yourself. If you're at a thousand Hertz, your, your window is gonna be right here. It's not gonna go any more than this. Right. And that's, that's a huge problem when most of the guys that are on the band will be able to hear you, but you will not hear them call you back. But if I'm trying to hear just that one, I could bring my receiver down, listen to that signal. Yes. And yeah. that so it's a matter of setting your transmit number, your receive number. Now you've got those offset by five hertz, not a lot. Uh, now but, the one thing you can do, and I, I wasn't gonna get into the nuts and bolts of the, of the mousey operations, but I will bring this one up. With a mouse, if you if somebody calls you and returns your CQ on a very crowded band and you look and see that you're at 16 and he's at 21, you can take your mouse, go over to where that 21 is and click on it, or you can take your receive and type it in on the screen. Either way will get you more attuned to where his location is. Back when we were talking about receive and transmit, WSJT's FT8 protocol is we decode what is in the receive green part first. Yes. Then we go out from there. It so, starts with that receive green part. So you go back and forth with that. If he's here and you're here, then you're going to be trying to send your stuff where he should be. So for the people on Zoom that we've got to do some color commentary, you've got that little green box up at 1600. And that's where this started. But your system answered AB0YM, who is that one up at about 2100. 400 hertz off. So it started in the little green box and said, there's nothing here. And it moved itself out. So that's right. Theoretically, you can... You can demodulate anything in this pass bag. It'll just take it a second to pull it out of the noise. Yep. It's going to have to work harder to look for a really weak signal in this. Whereas if this AB, AB0YM, there's a nice Matterhorn there, isn't there? There's yeah. a big mountain. If that was just a little moon bounce kind of signal, you want to make sure you're in that green window Yes. Because now my computer, my FT8, only has to look at, I don't know how many hertz that is, but it's like 100 hertz as opposed to 3 kilohertz. Most of the new computers out there are fast enough with processing that it's not really a big deal. Now, I, I generally don't pay too much attention if the band's open. If the band's not open and you're trying to pull something out of the noise, that's when you can Yeah, exactly. but if that signal is very small, it's a matter of the signal to the noise, and if I'm looking across an extremely narrow band, it's gonna be easier to find that signal than if I'm looking yes. across wide band. Yep, you can do that. Any others? 
with any questions before we go into uh, MSK. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Okay. Didn't see anything else. MSK 144 is the successor to FSK 441. And they're both digital modes that were designed for meteor scatter. Bringing up, up here, we've got a fast graph. The fast graph actually plots the time of your transmission, and it shows bursts of audio that are decoded, or bursts of audio that may or may not be decoded. And main window remains the same. I'm still in the my ICOM configuration because the configuration for this mode doesn't really change the base configuration. We do select our calling frequency, 50.260. We're gonna change our decode to fast. We're gonna make sure that the frequency tolerance is set to 100. That basically is looking in a window of 100 Hertz. The standard for using MSK is 1500. So you put your transceiver on the calling frequency and you look in a window between basically 15, it's, it's 100, but it's 100 either side. So you're looking basically between 14 and 16 for those bursts. TR sequence is 15 seconds, 15 on, 15 off. Now, MSK is one of the few that they have where you can actually variably select a transmit period larger or smaller than what is considered the norm. Um, one of the reasons that they've done that is many, many, many meteor scatter contacts are scheduled. In fact, you know you need to work somebody, you get together, okay, we're gonna plop down and we won't go use the calling frequency, we'll use a different frequency and we'll go to 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off. Or let's try it the other way, we don't have that many meteors, let's go to 30 seconds on and 30 seconds off. So it can be changed. You've got monitor on, and this was a scheduled contact where I'm going to be looking for a certain person, and that's uh, KN4JX. We put his call into the DX call. We put his grid, Echo Mic 05, into the DX grid. We've got a calculation. He's 430 miles away. And he's got a bearing. I can't read the bearing from here anymore. Thank you, 128. Next time I'll remember the right glasses. <laughs> so, there it is. We've, we've spotted a meteor scatter audio burst. And it was actually decoded. You can see the decode popped up over here in my uh, band activity. This time we're gonna start sending a reply. There's a signal strength that we received from him in DB. The software stores it, or you can man man manually enter a signal strength that you might wanna send back. It appears in TX2 and in our reply. You can see it out there. It says, our, I believe it's R24.
Now, he was CQing on the second. So we're going to be transmitting on the first. We've got that set up with transmit first. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the times on the uh, transmitted uh, window, you'll see that's what we're actually doing. <clears throat> When you're sent when when you're when you're CQing west, you transmit on the second. When you're CQing east, you transmit on the first. So you're change your box. You change the box. Right. Right. That's correct. Now, at this point, you'll see we actually had a couple more decodes in there. We're going to keep complete, keep sending until we get that RRR. And we got the RRR that added uh, Echo November 05 to my logbook. That's basically how MSK 144 operates. And that is now the standard for meteor scatter on VHF plus bands. There's a couple of add-in programs. One that I use is JT Alert. It provides audio, visual, and SMS alerts based on decoded call signs within MS, uh, WSJTX. Your alerts can be call sign, prefix, grid, state, province, country, more. They've got what, ITU, uh, CQ, um, zones. Now I put this into my computer and I added an SMS alert. It was one of the first things I did after I got back up and running and eSkip season was started. So I got my phone, I'm actually laying in bed doing a crossword puzzle and having my second cup of coffee at seven o'clock in the morning, our time. And my text alert goes off and I pick it up and it says, needed grid, Fox November 33. Southern Vermont. And so I quick like a bunny, jump out of bed, throw on my robe, run in there, look at it, it's still on the screen. I start answering the guy's CQ. Uh, I got a new grid square and I completed my WAS on six meters. At the same time, this little thing told me, I started using that and that was in May and I used that all the way through till the end of the E season. And in fact, it's still turned on, although the rig isn't turned on now. But that also helped me work uh, Mauritania. It also helped me work uh, three or four different grids. Because you can't sit there in front of the thing the whole time. You know, every once in a while, you got to get up and use the restroom. So amazing, amazing help. K1VT, K1 Vermont. One of the other things that JT Alert does is it interfaces with a variety of log programs. And uh, actually, James and John turned me on to DX Lab, which has DX Keeper. So I actually converted all my logs for everything, HF, VHF plus, converted everything into DX Keeper, and I'm using that now for my logbook. The nice thing about using this is you turn on logging in WSJT. If you have JT Alert turned on with logging, JT Alert 
will go ahead and automatically log to the keeper. JT Alert will also automatically log. Oh, let's go to the next one. It also will automatically allow logging to Logbook of the World. And it also interfaces with all of the call sign databases. I've got uh, a subscription to, I think it was QRZ. I think it's 29 bucks a year, which goes ahead and fills a lot of that stuff in, in there for you, for your, for your logbook. Very, very helpful. In fact, it, it's not just for VHF Plus. I use that on all my HF stuff too. And I mean, it brings it up, fills everything in and keeps track of my GXCC, my worked all states and all that. It's a really nice additional program. What it doesn't do yet is automatically uh, make the contact for you and you can stay in bed. It will not do that. It will, I, I can't figure out a way to SMS back to tell it to start answering this guy's CQ. <laughs> well, I used that to text somebody this morning on my way in in the car. But, Notice I also added the, uh, the URL there in case you're interested in that. The other one is Grid Tracker. Um, I've just started using this. And it, well, there's also a, a grid tracking type program in DX Lab that I haven't used yet. But this Grid Tracker has got a lot of nice offline things you can use to develop maps and uh, you know map yourself out things. It's got a lot of over overlays. It also can interface and or allow you to overlay things like gray line, st stuff like that. It's a really interesting program. Both of these, by the way, are absolutely free. Just go out there, download it, put it in your computer and away you go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's some of the other resources. Obviously, the first one is uh, the WSJT website. You can go out and grab that from Joe Taylor. One of the things that is used a lot with uh, grid chasing, um, and the grid chasers are mostly people who are looking at obtaining the Fred Fish Memorial Award and people that just want to increase their grid count. Um, there is now a Slack channel out there. It's got uh, uh, the Tropo, it's got Meteor Scatter, it's got uh, Rare Grids, and it's got EME. And a lot of the people that are doing the, uh, the EME especially, uh, they, they will set up SCEDs worldwide and they're using these kind of uh, uh, these kind of boards, live real-time message boards. They all have their own rules. One of us is you don't once you start your sked, don't talk about your QSO because basically your makes it kind of null and void. Um, let's see. His call is N zero UK up in Minnesota, and uh, Chris has. The SPLAT 65, which is a terrestrial board for all matter, <clears throat> excuse me, for all manner of uh, WSJT related stuff. <clears throat> One of the most well known is ping jockey, which is a term that uh, Doug used to describe those who do meteor scatter. Um, many people get on ping, ping junkie almost every day, making skeds to do uh, meteor scatter work. 
from six meters all the way up to 432. There's also a board up there for EME. So you can get out there and you can make skeds for any of these more esoteric uh, modes where you're trying to work uh, different grids and in many cases, different countries by using EME. Um, locally on the front range, if you're interested in six meters, there is a IO group out there, front range six meter group. They have a lot of interesting things. In fact, uh, they have a gentleman whose name is, I think his first name is uh, Ian, and he's with uh, the uh, National Weather Service. And, or or uh, no, what's the uh, NTIS? The ones that watch the sunspots. NIS. He is with NIS. That's who it's. And uh, we get regular re reports from him uh, with predictions. And his latest prediction, which actually I got last night, so I couldn't put it in here, is that we're going to in we're in for one heck of a sunspot cycle, and it's already starting to build. So this is going to be really well for VHF plus for anybody who has not dusted their HF off recently because the bands suck, um, you might want to look at dusting it off and uh, you can easily even use uh, FT8 up there if you want and uh, get back up on the HF bands. So at this point, anybody with any questions? <clears throat> well, thanks very much, Wayne and Doug. Um, we talked a lot about different modes of propagation, and you know for sure when you're using EME because you're pointing your antennas that direction. You know for sure when you're doing meteor scatter. But what about the other propagation modes? How do you know if you're doing sporadic E versus ducting versus tropo versus? Is it just a matter of distance and I don't know, how do you determine how you're getting there? Because you can't, you can't see where it's going. You just know who you're talking to on the other end. I think the, the easiest way to answer that question is in terms of distance, in terms of distance, if you're working E, double hop, F2. You can just take a look at how far away it's going. Three to 1200 on six meters, pretty much E skip. Longer than that, F2 and or double hop. Ducting, ducting from Colorado is uh, really almost a moot point, unless you are, unless you're like right on the Kansas border or something. I have seen reports over the years, um, N0LL out in Smith Center, Kansas. And I have seen some of the DX maps where you look at that map and he's on two meters and he is working from Texas to North Dakota, the other side of Missouri. And it stops right here, just before you get to the Rocky Mountains. And that's because as you go up farther, this level he's working at where the cold air is up here and it's creating that duct, or is it the other way around? The warm air is up there creating that duct, but then you start to move into the mountains, your moisture dries up. You don't have those conditions to create the ducting and even the scatter. Like when we, when I work, uh, Larry out in Smith Center on two meters, it's basically tropo scatter. And I'm running 100 watts to, at this point, I'm running one of those K1FO directive systems. And, you know, you'll hear him fade up and he'll fade down and he'll fade up. I know that's tropospheric scatter out to, well, he's 300. 
340, 350 miles from here. But he's a regular contact on two meter scatter, especially on the nets. There's a two meter net on Monday nights, uh, 8 p.m. local time. Uh, it's 144.22. If anybody wants to get their, ear, their, their uh, feet wet on two meter sideband. And when you get to the point where I think, I think I had one that was actually what they call TEP, which we didn't really touch on, trans-equatorial propagation. Uh, I worked my first South American, or first Brazilian, who was actually south of uh, the equator this past summer. And that was probably a, a mode known as trans-equatorial propagation. And that's kind of like when an e-skip goes so far and it bounces and then it hits another e-skip. Um, so the, the mechanics of how you get there is not so much as important as the fact that you're up there and you're there. I mean, you, you can watch the, you can watch the boards and see what they're saying it is but like that one that was on the graphic that Doug had, it had a call sign, it had unknown on it. Who knows what, it was in black. Who yeah. knows what propagation you used? It doesn't matter much because you, you made the contact. So my answer to that would be, you, you kind of just have to know. Uh, as Wayne points out, there is, and I did briefly mention it, transequatorial you will tend to, it will tend to map to a, a symmetric distance to the other side of the equator. You will rarely see transequatorial from, you know, if it's Colorado to, you know, it's gonna be south of Ecuador, Peru, you're not gonna see it uh, the same up to Minnesota, for example. So you kind of know that. If you're, from my experience of operating on the East Coast, if, I'm working auroral, you're going to hear the distortion, you're going to see, well, we're working to a similar latitude generally or north, we kind of know that's aurora. If it's going to the southwest from where I used to be in Massachusetts with a really big station, we would know on six meters, well, okay, this is probably e-skip versus ducting. Uh, tropo. It's the nature of the signal and where you're talking to and the distance. Sometimes you just don't know and they're miscoded on there and they'll say, you'll, you'll get people that'll say, well, I worked this on tropo and others have gone, no, there's no way that was e-skip. And, but the point is you're making contacts and uh, you'll recall I mentioned with that W2SZ six meter, we had the two stacks and we could elevate. The reason we would do that is it put it into a different area and it reduced that dead donut that Wayne was talking about because we realized we did have a donut that was dead. And in our case, we had this range at about 600 miles. And it was because we had no energy going to the right place in the ionos, you know, in the, to bounce back down and fill that in and we could just never work it. Well, we shifted and all of a sudden we'd fill that in, but we'd lose the other region just in front and behind. So you didn't want to always leave it there. You would work with the cloud depending on where you wanted to have the scattering fill in. Uh, constantly changing antennas and patterns and to, to fill in that map like Wayne did. Another thing that is like uh, one that happened to me this past summer is I was working a guy on meteors who was actually in Missouri. And this other guy came back to me on the MSK from Pennsylvania, which is way, way, way too far for meteors. And the other thing that was, that told me I was working e-skip was on that little graph where you saw the, the little where you were decoding the meteor, 
it started here and it decoded like all the way across the 15. And when I, when he came back to me the second time, it was, there was, didn't have to send it more than once. We were actually using eSkip on the MSK mode because the eSkip was there now. Whereas before it wasn't there. And I could try all day to work like this gentleman in Oklahoma in EM05. I could try all day if there was eSkip and I'd probably never work them because the eSkip is gonna just go right over top of them. But with the MSK, we completed it. Actually, I think we completed that queue in less than five minutes. Yeah. So it, 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 it is, it's, it, like Doug said, you've, you've got to almost know it or experience it a time or two, then you know what you're actually working. You know, we, uh, when we did VHF contests from the Northeast, we had a, we used to joke a kilowatt and four Yaggies on every band. So one operator would detect some propagation mode. And if you were out in the lodge, just relaxing, you'd start to see all the other antennas turn because we would tip off the six meter op would start to hear some Aurora and say, hey, two meters, I'm starting to hear Aurora. You're probably gonna hear it in 10 or 15 minutes, or I'm seeing some tropo and ev we'd all turn the antennas and see, are we getting into this? Uh, I remember one of my first contests on the mountain, uh, we had just an incredible duct that we could physically see from as we looked down out of, if you climbed up the tower so you were above the trees. Yeah, we had trees in, in the East Coast, so you know, we <laughs> couldn't stand on the ground and, and, you know, and see forever. And we'd look out and basically down the coast uh, line is where the little purple band started. And we just looked at it as we went the equivalent of looking to New York City, to Philadelphia, out to uh, Pittsburgh, out to Ohio and then the band kind of dropped away. And whenever we pointed towards this purple band on the horizon, which was the duck, the inversion, signals were really loud. And I remember being on two meters and I just split the difference with that eight Yagi array, which was very broad because the eight Yaggies compressed it down to the horizon. I was looking right into the duck, but I had a very wide azimuth. So I was sitting there and we had a multi-way CUSO with a gentleman in the upper peninsula of Michigan, a station in Ohio, a station in Tennessee, and K4CAW, who I think is a silent key now, in North Carolina. And we were all S9 the whole time, having a multi-way, just going back and forth, and there was nobody to work. It was a contest, so there was no reason to call CQ because we had worked everybody that could be heard through the duck. So we were just having a rag chew and occasionally somebody would pop in and we'd go, hey, everybody, let's work them. <laughs> we'd, we'd take turns working the guy and they were like, well, this is W2S says frequency. I'm like, work the guy, let's get some activity. And if we ever got enough people, we would break apart again. And then we'd come back and rag chew. It was like a lighthouse that was constantly there trying to attract attention but we knew that was tropo because of where we were working and how. Uh, the, the other that I remember is we were operating and dinner time came up and they served meals in this lodge where we were, uh, but we all had to go together. And so we had some college students that were there and I said, okay, well, you're, you're gonna run two meters over the next hour and turn the antenna and do, do your thing and, you know, he was new, but he says, I'm ready. Uh, college student from Great Britain. So we called him the Brit or the Limey. Uh, and so I'm in the, in the lodge and we had one of these little handheld receivers on sideband. We just kind of had it there and I could hear him calling CQ contest and knew it was working and told him to turn the antenna, the whole thing. And it seemed like it was dead because he wasn't answering a lot of people. So we didn't rush dinner and had our dessert and we came back out and I said, you know, have you been working anybody? It doesn't sound like you were. 
And he goes, well, no. You've been turning the antenna like I told you? He goes, yeah. There's nobody on the band? He says, well, everybody's up north, and they're all whispering. And I realized that was an aurora. And I was like, so I listened to the thing, and there's just distortion on all the signals. And I was like, can, can I give it a try? And he was like, sure. And I sat down, and I proceeded to work over the next 20 minutes while the aurora was peaked. I think I worked 50 stations, just one after the next, and then the aurora just dropped like a rock. I knew that was, but you, you're going to pick up on it. Chances are, though, you're not going to see tropo from here, but you might. You're probably not going to see aurora. It's probably going to be e-skip or potentially tropospheric scatter, but most likely just e-skip. And you're going to work a lot if you've got that radio that'll do six meters and you can put your, your signal link. I really like those. Uh, I know Dean has an Elecraft that has a USB connector on the back. He just plugs it into his, radio, his computer and goes. My Elecraft is a little older. I don't have that module. I've got to use the Tigertronics. Uh, but uh, I think there's John over there. He's got his setup at home, and he can remotely connect to it, and he could be working people right now. He's just aimed his antenna out to where he thinks activity might be. I don't think you have a remote rotator yet, do you? But uh, a small antenna. The point is north, northeast. Yeah, but a small antenna. Now, you probably don't want a laser beam antenna because you're going to have to turn that. So if you don't have remote azimuth control, get something like a Moxon. So what I antenna are you solution. using, John? I went to our friend Tim up at Aero Antennas in Cheyenne and bought a cheap four element, all aluminum, six meter antenna. It comes apart, it transports easy. And so, it's one-to-one -one across the portion of the band that we want to use. What's the boom length of that? Probably 10 feet? Mm, 10 and a half feet. 10 feet. Not much. So you could get one of those from Tim at Arrow, very lightweight. And if cheap. you want something that's maybe a little better in the winter months, look at one of those Moxins that's going to be about equivalent. And then when you outgrow that, get one of the five element like Wayne has. Uh, John has one of those as well. I have four of them, I have and that's where we do the stack. Uh, you can grow with this. It's I'm doing it as simple and cheap as possible. I didn't I didn't go crazy because I can only use it a couple of months out of the year, and it's it's on a a, a tripod that's ratchet strapped down, and it's pointed north northeast, and. I probably made 750 contacts in two months this year. It's it's not hard to do with 100 watts. Very easy. Yeah. I'm using an IC7000, completely barefoot, a signal link, and an i7 computer. That's all you need to get started in it with a decent antenna. And you could probably do it if the band's open with a halo. When the yeah. band's open, you could probably talk on a clip lead across the country. It doesn't take much. Well, with the digital modes, yes. If you're going to do sideband, you probably want a, a small Yagi or a Moxon. You could do some stuff with a Halo, but it's, it's going to be a, a little tougher. I, I have an interesting thing. I, I live at 8,400 feet, and I have 3,000 feet of ground gain coming off the front of the the antenna, it pretty much just drops off. So if you're on a high point. Well, that's actually the opposite of ground gain. Yeah. <laughs> you want a little bit of foreground yes. to get that ground gain so you get the bounce. Yes. And that was the problem we had on Greylock that we had to do the up tilt because our lower lobe was just going down yeah. into the valley. So we had to take that whole thing and bring it up yeah. such that it, it got to somewhere that we wanted it. But yeah, it, uh, you know, I, I remember one year I, I didn't go back to the East Coast. That was, I was still going back a lot for contests, even living here. And uh, I heard my old group on the air, and I, I said, well, I, I want to I say hi and work them. And I was using just a little halo and my Elecraft, and 
they just couldn't hear me. Uh, so I went out and got my one of my Yaggies, set it up and put it out on a, I think I put it on the roof of the van. So it was only up about 15 feet and they were just barely able to hear me. And then I went and got the alpha and ran the power cord and throttled it up to about a thousand watts. And they came back, hey, Doug, great to hear you. <laughs> it makes the difference. But if, I, if we were running FT8, they would have probably been able to work me with the halo at 100 watts. So what other questions you guys got? If not, I've got a question for you and we can even open up the phones. Uh, uh, take the phone lines for caller three. Um, who has never done this before that wants to give it a try? Would you consider, okay. So this was maybe worth your time. The thing about this is I'm really torn and I, if online you wanna chime in just chime in and I'll shut up here. And, but I was a little worried that for years and years, we've had the philosophy, use it or lose it. You look at the three gigahertz band and people say, there's only people on there for a contest a year. Well, we've been using it for microwave. We still lost it or are losing it. Probably the league is trying to turn that around, but I don't know how successful they'll be. But 903, 1296, we at least used a major portion of the band. Now when we go to FT8, we're all on the same frequency. How are we gonna justify having four megahertz of 50 megahertz when all we do is use three kilohertz of it? But at least if multiple people are on, this technology will continue to grow. Joe and team in New Jersey will come up with, at Princeton, more and more bandwidth, more and more data through. Imagine if we had a wider band version of FT8 when Puerto Rico was pretty much off the air. What if we could send more than just a grid square across those transmissions when the bands really aren't good? I don't think they're there yet, and if you talk to Joe, he's not even sure we're gonna get there, but I have this feeling they are gonna get there. They're gonna find a way to send, maybe we have an easier way of sending NTS radiograms. Willem, would you like an easier way of sending a radiogram than by voice, you know? Well, we've actually been using JS Call for that, which is sort of a variation of J, uh, JST that you can actually send a longer message and it works great. You can't hear a thing on voice and you can still get through on. And you're doing this on like 20 meters or six meters uh, or? Mostly we've been using 40 and 80, but. Uh, 40 and 80, okay. There's no reason why you couldn't use 20 for long distance. But you see where this is going and people say FT8 is not ham radio. That's not ham radio. I wanna shout into a microphone and hear it in my ears. The old codgers are saying that. And I'm one of those old codgers now. I've had my license since 1977. So I didn't think this was ham radio, but it is. We're experimenting. We're figuring out how to get signal through when we couldn't do it before. That's ham radio. We're doing it at field day. We're doing it at the contests. We're doing it every day. Experiment, play, try to work some people in a mode you've never done before. I think our repeater networks are great, but there's more to, out there than just our DMR network and our Calcon and our DRC repeater. Give it a try. No other questions? Willem, close us out, I guess. You're the, you're the professor. Do you wanna give the final exam? Or do you want us to, to <laughs> we're gonna pass out the blue books. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Doug and Wayne, for putting this all together with you, appreciate it. And thanks again to 
all of our AV guys for pulling all of this stuff. Good in. job. What time did our AV team get out of here last night? So they were here from after work time through 10 o'clock, and then they were back here again early. I called up the guys from up north and said, do you want to carpool down? And I guess you said coming from Boulder, and they said, yeah, but you're going to have to leave. We're going to, they skipped breakfast, and they were down here setting up this morning again. So good job, guys. And uh, for those who are new here, we have stuff to hold out. So uh, please give us a hand uh, putting this all together and, and getting it back in, in John's truck. Um, so, um, uh, a heads up on a couple of things. Uh, uh, next week, the, what's the date? Um, the 20th, uh, Chris Keller is going to give us that uh, talk on chirp again. So that will be a tech talk uh, on, uh, no, we moved the date. It's now Wednesday night, right? Wednesday, Wednesday night um, uh, at uh, seven o'clock. So um, it's always a very entertaining talk. Uh, and, and very useful if you're you're trying to program your radios um, using a computer with, with some free software, that's great. Uh, and then our next RM Ham University is gonna be on broader OS. So if you're interested in how a lot of the stuff over there uh, works and how you actually configure a MicroTik router from scratch, uh, please uh, come and join us then. And, uh, will uh, indoctrinate you into the RM ham way of configuring uh, uh, microtics. And of course, there's several more uh, very interesting talks for the rest of the semester. So we hope to see you all there. Um, we have room in the, in the room here. So if you want to attend in person, we'd encourage you to do that. And of course, uh, we will still have uh, Zoom available uh, for that as well. So thank you very much and we'll see you uh, next time. Thanks.